there's never going to be another Metallica. And I don't think there's ever going to be another Black Album. Uh, time, place, circumstance for everything. You know, now any any new band that comes out now, half the people like them, half the people hate them. But it seemed like at the time, man, Metallica was a, a, a you know force to be reckoned with uh, that didn't you know, take no for an answer, I guess. There are a few very important elements that made this concoction come together, percolate, and you know do what it did. Um, start out with the hard work of the band. So you go back to '83. So the boys are already doing the Kill 'Em All for One, playing Europe, getting their build, uh, following uh, in Europe before America even knew who they were. Did the hard work, went on the road, roughed it. Do we have to do the first couple times around? Is always the toughest, right? And then uh, lose Cliff, uh, devastating. That will never be uh, ever forgotten, or you know, never be able to come away from the changes that were made there and inside the people. And then I come in and we work four and a half years pretty fucking hard, buddy. And been a lot of places, 30, you know, 30 or 35 countries by that time, once we kind of wrapped that all up and made up for the shows with Cliff and then went on to the justice stuff and everything. Um, worked very hard. And we're talking again about the team that was established uh, from carpenter to manager to every person that took the pride in the band and uh, was there to do whatever was needed to make it happen, right? Everybody willing to work all hard and lose all the sleep necessary and everything to be victorious. That's the beginning. So you got what the tools that you need to work with. Next comes the arrangement of that. So when the managers work it out that they set you up with all these opportunities amongst the demographic of how many ever millions of people that are 12 to 32 years old that would get down with a loud guitar music across the globe because we were global already and we were ready for that chance it was set up it was like we're just waiting for us to take it you know so the record comes out and it sounds great right across the board and it covers a bunch of ground you know the weighty stuff speedy stuff good heavy stuff in the middle um and the secret of it all secret i don't know it's what the what came in and now we know is not as knowledge in fact uh the softest song that we ever had is called nothing else matters and it's up to that point and uh there was already fade to black and things like that but the radio only certain college radio or something like that would ever play that song it was never a thing there was never appeal like that for metallica to it as nothing else matters comes out as the third single or whatever it was as far as about that stuff it comes a little bit later you know that time we already been out on the road and building the following the softest song broke down the tallest, strongest barriers for battery and fight fire to get through, right? We couldn't have done it the other way around. It would not have worked the other way around. The radio, the way it was at the time, the listeners of that radio, the way it was at the time across the globe, ready for that song to appeal to everybody, right? So not just the people who are going to come to the concert to hear the heavy shit. Now it's all that starts to be getting to the mainstream of things, an addition, because we have people from the heavy still want to see it too. So all of a sudden it goes from 30 to 50 countries that they want us to play in. And we get and run on the road for, you know, going back to what you're here. Where were you when? Uh, so <laughs> like five or six months into the thing. And a uh, dude comes into the, to the dressing room and says, uh, no, uh, nothing else mattered. Number one, 30 countries this week, 30, three, zero, 30 countries this week. Like, mm -hmm. And they've asked us to come to Timbuktu that never would give us the time of day before. Right? So they set us up. That's, so that's my point here. The managers, promoters, and all those things, radio people, the team that made that all happen, they set us up for the next shows. Set us up for success. We went and crushed them. Anything that they would set up for us, we would go and take care of business like everyone expected us to do. So the promoter would ask us back again. So that's really kept going, going, do, 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 like that, right? We were set up by those people to do that. So those elements are on a place. You understand all those elements. I'll take the one chronologically that actually made it all possible. ACDC and Iron Maiden from early 80s up through the time that we were coming to that spot right there. They had played those 35 or 37 or 39 or whatever it was, those countries that allow westernized heavy music by that time. It wasn't, you know, this thing couldn't keep it, or communism, Islam, whatever, didn't keep it from coming there. They went to all those places first. 
They knocked on the first batch of trees and kind of gave us a rough road. Some of the places they paved that shit in some of the bigger cities, you know? But in those outskirts and stuff, they broke down the out and then we had to go through and make it happen. If they wouldn't have come and done those places for those people in that and making the fandom of heavy music foundation, right? Then we wouldn't have been able to do what we did either. So all those things together I just explained aligned like planets. And we were, we had enough conviction as a collective to do it. And as individuals, the determination and the talent, but also not ever wanting to let the other guy down. It was one of our cardinal rules within the band is you never want to be the weak one on the stage, right. ever. So whatever it takes, Kirk, yoga, Jason, bicycle, Lars running every day, whatever the hell you need to do to be that, that's what you do as an individual. So the understanding of all the people within it knew that we were made of that. So they put their efforts into it. And that collective effort became something we're talking about 30 years later right now. Normally I would end right there because that was a perfect way to end it. But I do need to do one thing. Okay. I've had I've had Michael Gilbert on the podcast twice. Yeah. We always end up talking yeah. about you. So now we need to flip the script and talk to talk about how amazing the last few Flotsam and Jetsam records have been. Michael Gilbert is a bad motherfucker. <laughs> All right. That's it. So we're speaking about tenacity and all that kind of thing and loyalty at the poster child right there. Um, you know, he came into our band, he was 16 years old. I mean, we had to, we had to sneak him and he had the cool, you know, he already had way cooler gear than us. He could play that crazy Slayer shit and everything. We're like, okay, but melded right in. And uh, we used to have to sneak him into the club, you know, we get permission from the club guy. Okay, he's not gonna drink or nothing. Now we're gonna bring him in through the back. You're gonna go on the stage. As soon as we're done, we can take him right back out, okay? And a bunch of times we had to do that, you know? And he hung right in there. Uh, and now he's the uh, you know spearhead of the band and the the uh, the heart, you know, still still keeping it alive, and so that uh, I'm not my respect for that, but he's also a real straight shooter of a person, you know, always prepared, very honest, keeps himself fit, um, does what he says he's going to do, man, you know, that, that's all I got for that. I I don't know if he told you or not, but you know when we when James got burnt, uh, when he got torched by the Montreal. Uh, mm -hmm magnesium flash um michael came in and played a couple songs with us oh really uh, we had um jeff from annihilator oh wow yeah and uh andrew jeff andrews what's his name jeff waters jeff andrews is from kirkus exodus <laughs> <laughs> wow steel trap dude yeah. what the hell? um jeff what was it waters waters jeff waters from annihilator came down he's pretty tough uh, Michael came in and played a few songs. Andreas from mm -hmm. Sepultura. And that was, you know, that's what I wanted. He was, he's vicious. Oh, yeah. Another one of my favorite people. See so him and Mike Gilbert, two of my very favorite people. Um, anyway, so yeah, a lot of, a lot of uh, respect for Mike and uh, through time for him, you know, flying the Flotsam flag. And you are correct about the quality of the Flotsam music. Uh, I got to tell you that, um, see what you do? <laughs> so... Back in 2012, um, we had done December 2011. We did the uh, 30th anniversary at the Fillmore, Gorefield Fillmore, with the, the shows through the week there with the guests. Yeah. And uh, uh, I got pretty excited. <laughs> I got kind of screamed back into it. I got the giant adrenaline dose again. It was right, like right. Two, two weeks went by. I swear to God, it was like two weeks went by and I went back on. Oh, what is what you're supposed to be doing? What the fuck? Well, this is very, <laughs> very familiar right now. It felt really good. I was in the right place. I felt strong, you know. I'm going, you know, what are my options here? I'm going to try to play heavy music again for just a second. Seems like everybody still likes me. Let me see. Uh, so I could try to get a band together and make a super group. Or you could do, you know, whatever the fuck. The thing's going through my mind. But there's still Flotsam. There's always Flotsam. What's about, what about, you know, I had Kelly came back and everything's going on and could we get the original recording band of Doomsday together and perform Doomsday in its entirety? And that would be our show. And we'd go and do our, you know, whoever would have us. I, I imagine it would end up being a few people. But, um, 
whoever would have us. And then, so I went to Phoenix um, in February of uh, nine, no, 90, Jesus, because see, we got me a ways back. <laughs> Woo, buddy, so the fuck, that was quite a while later too, wasn't it? So it was 20 years later. Well, um, February 92, February 92, nope, February of 2012. There we go. February of 2012, um, went to Phoenix uh, a weekend and then to, took a break and then the next weekend, it was two weekends of February, and got the guys together, original band. Edward came back out. He was living in California, so he came to Arizona. And we got together and started knocking down the flotsam tunes. And I'd been, I'd been working on them the best I could, you know. And I'm like, fuck. And even after playing in Voivod, it was like, this is crazy shit. Even back then, remembering all the speed and the dexterity, I'm like, wow, dude, you guys can, can't remember what I came up with. It's like just nutty. So many songs came and went since that time. Just, wow. So we get in the room together and all five of us are looking at each other. We're all laughing and smiling. We're still alive. We're like, what the <laughs> hell happened? Right? And, but it felt so good and it was strong. And by that time, like, I brought my gear and I had my wah and my system and all that. I never had that in flots in there. Right. You know, so I'm like, <laughs> and it was there was new dimension to the old songs because of it and you know, the spots where there's bass solos and all that going off and you know just cool shit and tight and snappy like snap snap is the word lots of snap and the the one thing that uh i think that the the thing that left metallica when i left was snap you know they just they did just this not the same snap this is not the same snap but the, the snap comes along with from flotsam that's why i said those words at all right there yeah. because that came from flotsam and that's what i brought to metallica was that snap um they get together with the guys and then we just be with each other go out for some dinners go out for meals with their families hang out with their kids for a minute see what their real world is like because i've been away from it for so long you know i went away from 86 and we're talking about that time later so it's quite 26 years ago whatever right so it's quite water under the bridge they had kids that were already 20 years old and stuff and uh, whoa it was a lot for me to take in or take on also because within all of that that means that would have been my bill and my dime I'm not afraid of that, but only at certain spots. I'm willing to I'm willing to back the band. I'm willing to get the gear going and hire the crew and stuff like that. But the you know, other stuff can't be my responsibility. So those kind of things would come into play. And because of my nature, I would want to make everybody okay and fix them and all that stuff. So it just was not in the cards. So I put together uh, the other guys for the Newstead band. Decided we'd go out and do what we did for, for that thing. But the, uh, the, the stimulation came from trying to go and and play with Metallica that first time for the 30th anniversary thing. Anyway, it was cool. Well, you did have plans for those millions, and it wasn't sandwiches. So That's true. <laughs> and the cool thing is that what worked out is that I was able to have the place that I wanted, and I still can have sandwiches. And if you ever get the itch, itch to uh, play metal, you know, Megadeth's looking for a bass player. So Still? <laughs> no, I don't. Well, they have a touring one right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that, that was, wasn't that kind of interesting for a minute? That was, fun. That, thing, that was, God, dude, what the? Jesus Christ. What a flip of a thing, but we won't go into the backstory of it, but they, just that little talk about that, you know, um, I, I just, I don't know if I would ever do something like that. It's not a, you know, it's just not in my purview anymore. I'm so busy with other music and play all the time with other kinds of people. It's just, I like playing the heavy stuff every now, now and again, but I really enjoy the composition now and proper, like different instruments and dimensions to the songs and three or four voices going and female background vocal and cool shit you know like music and whoa that's way more what i'm after now tonight i'm gonna go play with this eight eight piece band here that i just just starting my network up in my new home here in, in new york and uh, yeah i'm excited to throw i've got 10 songs that i've given that i'm gonna run through tonight and see what they're made of you know but it's like cool shit man you know uh johnny cash ring of fire you know and you got they got a horn section oh wow you know i'm gonna get some shit going so that's where i'm at and if, and if uh, Andreas calls and says, come out and fill down, uh, you know, half an hour of Sepultura with me and somewhere, and I'm there, you know, there's that, there's things about, I think it's a, this is a good place to talk about it because you've got the ear of quite a few of these people. Um, this thing came out in uh, a Florida interview for, it was, I think it was an art uh, exhibit interview actually. And there was something about, you know, my shoulder surgeries and I say, I, I can't play Metallica songs anymore and all this stuff. And people start running with this thing. Like, are you, sh are you sure that you listened to what I said? You know, are you sure that you heard the words that I said? Or did somebody just run with this part and then they made up this big goddamn thing? But just, I want everybody to, to realize that if 
whoever asked me to come and play bass, you know, and if it was for real, then I would be there to play bass. And if it was Metallica asked me to play for that many songs or that fast or that slow or whatever, then I would go and do it. There's not a thing where I can't do that. I was saying it like, I'm probably not going to go on tour and do two and a half hours every night with a band anymore. That's not just something I'm probably going to do. You know, it's not that I can't do it. I just, that's not something. <laughs> I already did that a bunch of times. <laughs> but, it's um, uh, something that's important for everybody to know. Um, yeah. The uh, camaraderie of Metallica, uh, the band that made the Black Album, um, because this has come up these last few weeks and our, you know, we call it togetherness on it. You know, uh, it's something I'm really happy about. I've always tried to stay on the high road and uh, always speak more. Here we go, I'm going to wrap it up, baby. <laughs> Pridefully of this band and my experience with these guys and the opportunity opportunities that they afforded me and still do to this day. We did something very special and things that happened and the plants that aligned that we've explained here pretty pretty good why it happened the way it happened but it couldn't happen without the hard work right and everybody worked really hard for what we have now and continue to receive it's not for everyone there's that's why there's only a handful of bands that can do it if you think about the positive influence that this album and this band that made this album have had on so many millions of listeners and maybe I'm not sure which one's more important, but and players. So millions of people pick up a guitar, a bass, or get on the drums because of this record. Not the other the other albums too, but this record. Okay, this is the one that you know in the guitar stores where you say no stairway, now it says no sand, <laughs> no sandman. You know, right. that's how it is now. Oh yeah. That, what that represents metaphorically is huge, dude, but it's real. How many kids picked up that guitar like we did when we heard Judas Priest record and learned Breaking the Law because it was learnable? And by the way, the same notes. Um, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> it's same man. You know, it's just that and Smoke on the Water is same, the same man too. So it's just something about those notes that catch everybody and everybody wants to learn them and they're so and they're so learnable and inspires people to want to play a little bit and feel the music flow through them. Okay, so that's my point about this babbling is that the once you do feel the music flowing through you, whether it's as a listener really fucking loud and you're singing along with everybody in the crowd and not stuck and being a part of something huge like that or actually playing the music and getting through Sandman at your sixth grade um, talent contest. You know, how many thousands of kids learned that as their first riff? It's just so, uh, uh, it's an amazing thing that happened. And how could we have ever planned it or anything like that? But that victory within all of that, and how it influenced so many people and will continue because the people they influence and stuff. It was just like a pivotal uh, cultural thing from uh, from a like heavy metal band, a real true throwing down heavy metal band, right? That can get still go as heavy as anybody, right? Yeah. Kind of set the standard for that shit. And so one, uh, that's the greatest part of the success. So you can measure all the thing by the dollars and the thing that the world measures it by. How do they, how do they title you? Okay, uh, Robert Duvall or, or uh, Derek Jeter, it says uh, uh, World Series winning home run champion, Derek Jeter. And then it says uh, Grammy award winning or Oscar award winning Robert Duvall says Grammy award winning Hall of Famer Metallica. That's how the world sees everything. That's how the world is measured. That's how you're introduced. That's how you're measured, right? This is the way it is. So we have those biggest titles possible preceding our names as individuals and as a collective. That's a pretty big deal, successful in the world's eyes, right? But in the down emotional like thing, guy in his room by himself with his record and his guitar and that's what he's got because everybody else is just fucking him or that type of thing or the world's spinning in a unfathomable way like now um, you just had in the last couple of years you got your guitar and you got your song, you got Metallica, you got Slipknot, you got whatever is your band is your favorite band, you know, that makes you feel a part of something. Okay, that's not something dollars can measure or titles can measure or any of that shit. And you think about the impact of 
how long this record has been on the Billboard charts, about all the things. If you go across the thing, there's only two albums now of original songs that have been 600 weeks on the Billboard charts. Two. And how many 800 records come out proper every week? And blah, oh my God, right? For how many ever years? Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, and Metallica, the Black Album. There's two others that are on there, but those are greatest hits records. So those don't count. There's two original albums that have been on the charts that long in history, as long as they've been keeping track. And it's band that goes, die. <laughs> oh man, what the hell, dude? Yeah. See, and we're talking about it 30 years later with smiles on our face and we're all prideful about it and all that shit. Look at us. Well, you almost got tears in my eyes. Uh, to, to you know, you you explained me to a T. It was crazy. I was I was twelve when this album came out. I had not been a Metallica fan before. Not really heard of the band. Inner Sandman video pops up, blows me away. I'm buying a bass. I'm buying all the records. I'm buying all the posters. You know, buying all the the you know. I think I had seven Metallica shirts for seven days in the week. You know, so uh, so yeah, I was one hundred percent that kid. And uh, that you know, honestly. If you want to go back, I mean, I'm not doing this if it wasn't for the Black Album. So, you know, the, the, the show and podcasting and everything else, man. Crazy times. That's the way to wrap that up right there. <laughs> if it wasn't for us making that record, you might not be sitting right where you're sitting right now doing what you're doing. Right? Absolutely, man. You could be president or something instead. Uh, most likely. <laughs> but this is way more fun. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine it is. <laughs>